OK. Let's talk about uh, linear least squares regression in the framework of our statistical learning theory setup. Let's set up the uh, empirical risk minimization problem and see what we get. So review. Linear least squares regression, input space would be? Uh, RD, OK. Input space x is RD. Great. Um, action space? Uh, what would produce R? Uh, outcome space? Uh, Good. Action space equals outcome space equals R. Fantastic. OK. Hypothesis space for linear regression. Functions from RD to R. Functions from RD to R. So let's write space F. We'll say contains functions of the form f mapping from, it's always x to a, so in this case we'll just write rd to r. Okay. Now, so we have the domain and the codomain of our decision functions, and what should we write down as the form for this such a function in our linear hypothesis space? Yes, yeah, so let's, so f of x, how would we write this for a linear function of x? Yeah, so we can write, um, if x is an rd, we can write the sum of w i x i for i equals 1 to d, where we'll use the convention that the subscript i here would refer to the ith entry of the vector x, for instance. OK. Or in vector notation, maybe w transpose x, right? Where w is also in rd, right? OK. So let's write an expression for the full hypothesis space. Hypothesis space f is equal to the set of functions of the form f of x equals w transpose x for w, for all, every vector w corresponds to a linear function. And we want to take the set of all those possible linear functions. So the set of all w, so w can range over what space, called a parameter space. w is also a vector in rd. So in this notation, for every w in Rd, we get a function f of x that takes an x and maps it to w transpose x, which written out is a summation like that, right? the inner product of w and x. So that's our hypothesis space f. Great. So now, what other ingredient do we need to write down linear regression? We need a loss function. So what's the loss function that we use for linear regression? Square loss. OK. So the, let's write down the risk of a function f. So the risk, whoops. The risk of f is equal to, how's it start? Yeah, there's an expected value. The risk of f is the expected value of a loss of the prediction of f on a randomly chosen x and y. So what's random here? Tell me all the things random in this expression for X and, X and Y are random. L is L as a function. The function is not random. You're plugging in random stuff to the inputs of the function, so the output's random. The function itself is fixed. Yeah, the function we know, it's the square difference. So let's expand that out. That's the expectation of f of x minus y squared. 
All right, so that's our risk of f for, we could do more, right? That's equal to the expected value of w transpose of x minus y. So now we've stopped referring to f, and we've replaced it with a w. So we need to adjust notation a little bit. Let's go back. Instead of writing f, let's write f sub w to say, What's the risk of f corresponding to the parameter vector w? And then at the bottom, we could write it in terms of just w. Oh, yeah, thank you. Good. All right. So that's the risk. All right, now let's get practical. What do we need to define? We need to write down empirical risk, right? We can't do anything with the risk, not really. The empirical risk, though, r hat f sub w. What's this? Read it off. One over Say again? 1 over n summation of. Yeah, let's suppose we have n data points. 1 over n summation of. W. Oh, now just copy what we wrote here. So, whereas before we had the expectation of this expression, now we want to get the empirical average on a data set of that same expression. So, instead of a random x and y, a single random x and y, we have the actual x, y pairs that we had in the data set. So, this is. W transpose x i minus y i quantity squared sum i 1 to n. OK. Whoops. So this gives us the empirical risk of f corresponding to w, the parameter vector w. So to do linear regression, what do we need to do now? Yeah. We need to find. So we want to do ERM. How? Yeah. Find the F sub W, or find the W that minimizes this empirical risk. Exactly. So find, we'll just, we can just say find W minimizing 1 on n sum You'll find this stuff in the middle of the slide deck if you want to. Yeah? Is there a reason why we choose squared loss for linear regressions and not some other thing? OK. So is there a reason we choose square loss for linear regression and not some other kind of loss? So um, in two weeks, we'll talk in depth about loss functions. And we'll find that square loss uh, is, has some advantages and some disadvantages. Certainly, it's easy to work with, and it's the traditional loss used for regression. Um, but there are other losses one might want to use too, like absolute value, absolute difference, is kind of the most common, second most common loss for regression. It's more robust to outliers. It gives what's called median regression. Yeah. Good question. So what we've done here is we've we've come up, we started the loss function. We came up with a hypothesis space. So loss was square. Hypothesis space was linear functions. And then from then on, we kind of went through our machinery. And we said, all right, well, we have the loss. We have the hypothesis space. We can write down the risk. We can write down the ex empirical risk. And now we want to find the empirical risk minimizer. And we have to minimize this function. And it turns out that. Minimizing a function is how we end up formulating most problems in machine learning. So our next module is a particular method, a practical method, to minimize an, a function. We call this an objective function, a function we want to minimize. And in the homework, the first lab, we'll apply it to functions of that form and maybe slightly more complicated than that linear regression form. All right.
So gradient and stochastic gradient descent are the topics of our next module here. So eventually our goal is to minimize the thing on the whiteboard. Let's take a step back and be a little bit more generic. So suppose we have an objective function f from rd to r, suppose it's differentiable. And we want to find the minimizer. We want to find the x that minimizes this function f. We've seen this in calculus, I'm sure. So the tool that is um, the easiest to use is the gradient. So you guys probably remember from multivariate calculus that the gradient is a vector that points in the direction of steepest increase. So let's, let's illustrate that. So imagine we have a function mapping from R2 to R. right? R2 is like a plane. And so let's imagine the floor is, is the plane. It's the domain of our function. And the function, the graph of the function, you can imagine, is like being a surface above the floor. right? The height of the function would be the value of the function. So the z level, the height, would be the value of the function. And the location on the floor, the x, y location, would be the input. Right? So input is from r2, some point on the floor. And the value of the function f is some height above the floor. Right? So, so here I am, some point in x, y space on the floor. And the value of the function here is maybe here. Right? And um, maybe it goes up this way as we go in that direction. And maybe that's the direction of steepest increase. And in that case, when we compute the gradient of this function, it points in this direction. So the gradient is a vector. And so I ask you, what space does this vector live in? So the gradient points in a direction of the input space. It tells you what direction to move in the input space, move in this direction. And so it's an R2. Yeah. So even though, even though the graph of the function exists in R3, the gradient tells you where to move inside the input space. The input space is the plane. So the gradient lives in R2. So when I point here, you can imagine that it's, like it's actually on the floor. It doesn't matter. It's, it's only pointing. It gives you a direction to move in input space. Is that clear? It's kind of a subtle point that's good to, to work out right now. All right, so where were we? So here's our function. And we compute the gradient. And we know from calculus that it points in the direction of steepest increase. All right. Now we want to minimize a function. That's what we've been talking about, minimizing an objective function. And the negative gradient points in the direction of steepest decrease. All right. So gradient descent, the idea of gradient descent is we compute our gradient. And we get the negative gradient. And that tells us where to go to have the function decrease as quickly as possible. And we take a little step in that direction. Right? And then we, we recompute the gradient. Maybe it's that way. And then the negative gradient will be this way. And we take a little step in that direction. And then maybe another negative gradient step here and here. And it's iterative. And we keep going until we decide to stop, which we'll come to later. So that's the idea of gradient descent. Compute the gradient, go in the negative gradient direction, some distance, repeat. OK. So what needs to be worked out there is how big a step. That's one of the things. That's the most important thing. When do you stop, is, that's easier to, to fudge. All right. So. We need a step size rule. That's what it's called. So here's two examples, two different ways to choose that step size. Uh, so first, let's talk for a second about contour plots. So this is a contour plot. This is representing a, a function on R2, just like we are drawing here. So this would be a contour plot where um, things of the same color have the same function value. And in this case, you never know which direction is increasing and which is decreasing, but they wrote these numbers here. So in that direction is increasing. So the minimum is here. And here we started, let's first do the red line. In this case, we used 
what's called a fixed step size rule, which is we compute the gradient. It's a vector in R2. We multiply it by something called the step size, and we step, we take a step of the resulting, uh, with the resulting vector. So terminology here is actually very confusing. So we're going to we're going to get to the bottom of it right now. But first, the gradient. So far, I've been talking about the gradient as pointing in a certain direction, right? But the gradient is a vector, and the gradient. Remember that the gradient is you take the partial derivative with res of your function with respect to each of your input coordinates, right? So what's the norm of the gradient vector? Let me ask a simple question. Is the norm of the gradient vector 1? Usually when you think about a direction vector, you think, oh, the vector just points in a direction. We don't care about how long it is. It's just giving us a direction. So you know, it's like you could think the norm is 1 to be kind of consistent. But the gradient does not have norm one. The length of the gradient has a very, has, actually has a meaning, doesn't it? It's the magnitude of the de de decline. So the longer, higher the, the higher the magnitude in the positive direction is the steeper yeah. ascent and vice versa. So the si the gradient tells you the rate of change of the function in the direction of the gradient, um, and so. If your gradient has magnitude g, say a number g, and you take a really small step in the gradient direction, then the amount your function changes will be g times how much distance you stepped. Okay? This is basic uh, definition of derivative. It's the rate of change of your function. So right, yeah. The, so the magnitude of the gradient is has meaning, and it's certainly not one. Um, so this gradient has a, it's a vector that has some length. And we're multiplying it by something called the step size. And so the length of our step, if we, so eta times gradient is a vector. Do you think the norm of that vector, the length of that vector is equal to eta or, or not? It's not, which is confusing because we're, it says step size eta. But the length of the step we're actually taking is not eta at all. The length of the step we're actually taking is eta times the norm of the gradient. That's, that's how long the step actually is. So this is confusing, but this is the standard terminology. So it would be more natural to call this maybe, I don't know, step length multiplier or something. But it's called the step size for better for, or mostly for worse. Um, but that's, that's good to know. All right. So when we say fixed step size 0.2, it's not like all of our steps are exactly the same length. This is not what's happening for fixed step size. What it means is we're always multiplying the gradient by the same number. So the steps may get shorter and shorter as we, as we converge to the minimum. What happens to the gradient at the minimum? Yeah. That's right. Uh, at a, for a local minimum of a function, the gradient will be 0. So it has norm 0. So you'd expect when you're very close to the gradient, the gradient has very small norm. And so the length of your step as you get close to the minimum will be very small, even if you have fixed step size multiplier eta. Right? So the red line. This is fixed step size eta. And you can see the steps get shorter and eventually converge to the minimum. Now, the black line is a different strategy for computing your step size. It's called backtracking line search. Uh, in this case, we're gonna, there'll be a description of it in the lab, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But the idea is uh, when you, you pick your direction you're going to go in, that's the negative gradient direction. And you, f you adapt how far you step based on um, uh, kind of based on the gradient value that you have at that point. So as we were saying, the gradient gives you a, the rate of change of your function when you move in a certain direction, right? So I know that if I take a small enough step in a certain direction, in the gradient direction, 
I know that my function should change kind of norm of the gradient times the size of my step. That's how much it should change. So suppose it's changing much less, much less than that. I'm not getting the amount of decrease that's predicted by the gradient norm. Well, that just means I took too big a step. Because in the limit of an infinitesimally small step, by definition of gradient, the amount my function changes will be determined by the norm of the gradient. So in backtracking line search, what you, you start with a potentially large step, and you say, did I get the, the amount of decrease predicted by my gradient, or some fraction of that? If not, shorten my step. Still not enough decrease as predicted by my gradient, shorten the step some more. So that's backtracking line search, where you choose how big a step to take so that you attain some reasonable fraction of the decrease predicted by the gradient. So uh, both can work. Backtracking line search is nice because you don't have any, you don't have much to tune. For fixed step size, you have to choose the step size, which is kind of a hyperparameter of the algorithm. Okay. So as I was saying, so fixed step size works eventually as long as the step size is small enough. Um, in a sense, we can make precise. If the step size is too big, this gradient descent may not work. It may diverge. It may not find the minimum. So yeah? If the step size is really small, you could also get stuck in a local minimum, right? Oh, great question. We want to get into local minima. <laughs> so the, uh, we have very little theory about how to hop from one local minima to a better local minima. So a lot of optimization is about how do you find a minima, a local minima. And um, most of this course, well, at least the first half, we're talking about um, objective functions that turn out to be convex. So linear regression is one example. So convex has, has uh, all the global minima are also local minima. So this is not an issue for things like um, neural networks, not convex. So you do have this issue of local minima. So, um, but still, the strategies that seem to work best tend to be fixed step size stochastic gradient methods, which we're going to get to soon. So, yeah. So for backtracking line search, if the function value increases with the uh, step size, do we back backtrack to the point where we started, or do we start from the point where we landed? OK, great question. So I think, so you're saying, We've chosen our step direction, the negative gradient. And you're saying when you probe the value of the function by taking steps in the negative gradient direction, the function is larger than you started at. Um, so this is possible, but it's not possible if your step size is small enough. So by definition of being differentiable, the negative gradient direction will always take you um, either, either, it won't, either you're at a minimum, in which case the gradient's already 0. Or the negative gradient direction will always decrease your function as long as your step in that direction is small enough. Excuse me? Yeah. yeah. For fixed step size, is it possible that you'll never reach the minimum? We are going to be oscillated around it. The question is, is it possible you don't reach the minima because you'll oscillate around it? All sorts of stuff can happen if your step size is not small enough. Oscillate around it, go off somewhere you don't want to be at all. But there is a step size for any function with some conditions, which we'll talk about in a second, such that if the step size is that small or smaller, you will converge to a local minimum, it will, or converge to the minimum of a convex function, to be precise. All right. So let's do some intuition. Let's, let's, let's have a. Let's develop some intuition on when we would want to take a small step size and when a large step size. Okay. So let's go back to our function in, on the plane, R2. So I'm here. My step direction is this. My negative gradient direction is here. And suppose I have a fixed step size. Take a step, I end up here. I recompute my step direction, the negative gradient. And it's this direction. And then I do it again. 
and I do it again. And you see that all the steps seem to be in the same direction. OK, that's situation one. OK, situation two. I start here. This is my first step direction. I take a step. Compute my next step direction this way. I take a step. I compute my next step direction this way. I take a step. And then again, I take a step. OK. So the first example, all the steps were really aligned. OK? Very slowly changing step direction. And in the second example, the step direction was changing quite quickly as I moved. So in which example would you want to have a, would you think to have a larger step size? The first one. Yeah, because the step direction is not changing much. So maybe you should just take a bigger step and skip ahead a bit, right? OK. So that notion is, there's a theorem that captures that notion. So how do we formalize? what I was illustrating here. So the gradient wasn't changing much as we moved in space. So the gradient was changing very slowly over the input domain. So you're thinking something like, oh, it sounds like maybe like a second derivative thing. The change in the change, the change in the gradient. Right. So that's right. So if, you're, if you have a second derivative that's in some sense small, then you'd want to take bigger steps. And the second derivative, the gradient's changing very quickly, you'd want to take smaller steps. OK. So let's, let's make that precise. Getting a little mathy here, but I think the concepts are very clear. So here's a theorem about convergence of gradient descent. And so we started the function from Rd to R. Right? Let's assume it's convex. So we didn't define convex yet. For now, we're going to talk about it more formally in a little while, not maybe in a few weeks. But roughly picture a function that's bowl-shaped, opens upwards. It has no, it only has one, um, it doesn't have multiple local minima. It just has one, or uh, just one local minima. And it can have multiples, but they have to be like in the same place. It could be flat. But. All right, so the function is convex and differentiable. All right, so that we could take a gradient. And we want the gradient to be what's called Lipschitz continuous, right, with constant now. Have you guys heard of Lipschitz continuity? Yes, because we took people who know a lot of math. That's great. But it has a very, this definition is actually rather intuitive. So the gradient of f at a point x, and we compare that to the gradient of f at another point y. Remember the the point, the slope of a, you could talk about the slope of the secant between two points. It's like the change in the gradient, the norm of the change in the gradient between x and y. You can imagine, then here we have the distance between x and y on the right. You could bring that over here. So it's like the norm of the change in the gradient divided by the norm of the distance between x and y. That's like how far, how much does the gradient change when we move from x to y? So it's like the rate of change in the gradient as a function of how far we're moving. Uh, yeah. So if that is bounded by L, that means that the gradient never changes more than L when we move a distance. It changes at, at most rate L per distance moved. Is that clear? OK. So in other words, L characterizes how the fastest that our gradient can change in norm, in norm. No, rather the norm of the change in the gradient, not the change in the norm. Yeah. So we could rethink that as if you think the gradient of f as another function, then the gradient of that function is bounded. The absolute value of that is bounded by L, right? Because for any x and y. So if the gradient g is is grade f, is grad f. Yes. So then g, the gradient of g is bounded by L, the absolute value, uh, because for any x and y. Uh, no matter how close or how far we take them, the the, gra the gradient of the secant of x from x to y is always less than or equal to. So you're you're connecting the derivative to the Lipschitz bound, yes. So I'm, I'm just saying maybe that could an interpretation of that could be that 
if you think of uh, gradient of s a, f as a function, then that the gradient of that function is kind of bounded between. Yes. So you're connecting the fact that so if f were twice differentiable, mm -hmm. then it would be equivalent to say that there's a bound on the second derivative in this way. Yeah, that's right. So the second derivative, in a certain sense, because it's multidimensional, but yeah, the bound would be, you would bound the second derivative. Here we get around that. We don't need a second derivative to write this this way. That's true. But there's a connection between the Lipschitz constant, the bound on the Lipschitz constant, and the bound on the derivative. Absolutely. Uh, mean value theorem. OK, so that's just the setup for the theorem. So we have this f that has some control on how quickly its gradient is changing. And the theorem is, if we do gradient descent with the step size 1 over l, then gradient descent converges. And then this is just some details on rates of convergence. But let's just focus on 1 over l. So, so if we have a, a function whose gradient changes very slowly, is L large or small, the Lipschitz constant? Gradient changes slowly. So this is small, even when this is kind of big. So L is small. OK, so L is small. And so the step size given in the theorem is large or small? OK, so gradient, change is changing, so gradient changing slowly is small Lipschitz constant, which is large step size. Okay. So what has this given us practically? It actually has given us something practically, which uh, otherwise I wouldn't include it. And what it has given us is a lower bound on the step size that we need to try if you want to do fixed step size. So what we know from the theorem is that gradient descent with fixed step size t less than or equal to 1 over l, if the step size is smaller than 1 over l, this thing converges. So we're guaranteed a convergence if it's smaller than 1 over L. So it's an upper bound on the things that the theorem guarantees convergence for. Now, all else equal, would you rather take smaller step size or larger step size? Well, if all else equal, meaning suppose they would all converge, would you rather take smaller or larger? Yeah, OK, larger. So the theorem says that you're safe if you use 1 over L. And that's the largest of the thing it's guaranteeing. So this theorem says, if, no matter how conservative you are, you should always go at least 1 over L. Now, in practice, you can often get better conver faster convergence with larger step sizes. It's just the theorem doesn't guarantee it. So it's still worth searching for larger step sizes, but never go smaller than 1 over L, because we know 1 over L converges. Yeah. So the step size here is the real, the true step size, not the step size multiplier. No, it's the step size multiplier. Whenever we say step size, it's always this multiplier. Multiplier? Yep. Okay. The step size, ah, sorry. This should have been eta. Apologize for writing t. This should be eta. Yeah. Yeah. Is the reason that in practice we can use a much larger step size because that L applies to the entire space, whereas we only care about what the L would be on the path that we're taking? OK. So there's all sorts of reasons that this could be loose, that you could take a bigger step size. One of them is that this is a requirement, a global requirement on the gradient. And right, we only care about the path we're on, for one thing. Uh, even then, I don't know that this is tight, but that's, that's certainly one spot for looseness in the bound. All right, so practically speaking, we have, we could try fixed step size. 1 over L, if you could compute this Lipschitz constant, with which for most of our um, things that we'll be talking about in this class, you can, in fact. Uh, so never go below 1 over L, and you could experiment with other fixed step sizes. And then I briefly explained, and we'll see more in the, in the lab write-up, backtracking line search is another strategy. OK. OK. Here's something for you guys to think about. I don't want to kind of drill into it as a group right now. We can come back to it perhaps, but kind of a thought experiment for you. So there's a machine learning textbook that says kind of offhandedly, empirically, eta equals 0.1 often works rather well. And you may find the same to be true. OK, but does this make any sense? <laughs> 
maybe, I don't know. So, so how can one rate work well for most functions? So here's what I want you to think about. Suppose we did the, the search and point 0.1 works well for function f of x. Let's make a new function, g of x. g of x is f of 10x. Right? So, so just very quickly, um, does, f change, does g change faster or more slowly than f? So if we take a, a step of size 1, if we step from x is 0 to x is 1, say, on g, what happens to the argument of f? It goes from 0 to 10, right? right? So it seems like g should be changing more quickly. So would that suggest a bigger or smaller step size? OK. So here's what you should think about. So bigger or smaller step sizes, think about the magnitude of the gradient, because the size of the step you actually, actually take Remember, is the step size times the gradient magnitude. So think about the magnitude of the gradients of g and f, and then the Lipschitz constant for g and f, and see if see what you learn. I don't have okay. I don't have too much to say about stopping conditions, um, but one very common one is you monitor the norm of the gradient, and when it's below some threshold epsilon, you stop. And this is inspired by the fact that. At the minimum, at the local, at a local minimum, the gradient is zero. Okay. So in our scenario, so this is very generic. This doesn't have to have anything to do with machine learning. This is just function minimization. But for us, we're going to be minimizing objective functions, empirical risk minimization. And so what we can do is we can track the performance of the function we're getting, the prediction function, on the validation data, for instance and see when does the performance on the validation data stop improving. That would be a way that we can decide when to stop. That's commonly used. Okay. Yes? Um, how does the backtracking line search compare with respect to step size in terms of rate of convergence? In terms of? Rate of convergence. Oh, rate of convergence. So the question is, how does backtracking line search compare to fixed step size in terms of rate of convergence? It turns out they're the same if you have the step size right. Yeah, good question. So putting it in other words, which would be easier to uh, tune? Uh, if, would it be easier to find a good uh, hyperparameter for backtracking line search or? Uh, so so f for my money, I would do, for gradient descent, I would do backtracking line search because there's nothing to worry about. You just run it and it goes. But what we're going to come to next, there is no backtracking line search. So. Oh, well. All right. So it turns out that what we've spoken about so far is gradient descent for an arbitrary function. All right. We needed to be able to compute a gradient, so differentiability we needed. To get our convergence, we needed Lipschitz uh, gradient. But otherwise, a generic function. But what we're actually going to be minimizing has this flavor. The first function, certainly, is an average of stuff is actually each thing that we're averaging is a loss function on a single data point. Right? How does w fare on the point x, i, y, i? Let's look at its square loss on that one data point. Right? The full objective function is the average loss across many data points. Right? That's the loss function we're actually trying to minimize. And it turns out if we leverage the specific form of that loss function, we can do, we can do more. So this is the linear least squares empirical risk function that we wrote down on the whiteboard. Let's generalize this a bit. So now we have the more generic form for an arbitrary loss function. Still. Um, Still a hypothesis space parameterized by w, some vector, but we're no longer limited to linear hypothesis spaces. All we're saying is that we have a hypothesis space f, and we can specify any function in that space by a vector w in Rd. So we were doing the same thing last week with polynomials, right? We had this vector of uh, coefficients of our polynomial, so we were able to characterize those functions with a vector. 
parameterize those functions with a vector. So here too, we're only assuming that all our functions are parameterized by w, our space is parameterized by w, and we have an empirical risk that's in the form an average loss, which is the definition of, the most general definition of empirical risk. Okay. So we can do gradient descent on this. Sure, no problem. What happens when we take the gradient of this expression? If you put the gradient out front, remember our rules of differentiability? The gradient would come inside the 1 over n and inside the sum. That's by linearity of, of gradients. And we have the average, so the gradient of the empirical risk is the average of the gradients of the losses. Quick check. What are we taking the gradient with respect to? W. What are we trying to minimize this expression over? The vector w, right? W characterizes the function we're, the function we're considering, and we're trying to find the best possible function. So we're trying to minimize this over w. If we do gradient descent, we take the gradient of this expression, and we'd end up with the gradient moving inside this sum, and it would be the average of these gradients of the losses at each training point. All right. So like that. So there's something that's a challenge for us in the big data era, which is that to compute this gradient, to compute the direction for just one step of gradient descent, we have to look at all n of our training points. Now, n can be really large in modern big data sets. Right? You could take, I know, take, take a full day just to look at every data point in a large enough. You could, data sets can be terabytes, exabytes. So in some sense, this is prohibitive. This is an issue. So the question is, can we get by without looking at every data point? Can we have some kind of like approximate gradient step direction that doesn't have to look at all the, gradient, all the data points? So the idea is, what if we took, what if we thought about noisy gradient descent? So instead of computing that gradient exactly, what if we were satisfied with an estimate of the gradient? Right? So how might we estimate the gradient? So this is the gradient. It's the average of n points, where n could be huge. All right. So how are we going to get? A how can we estimate that? Take a random sample. Yeah. Sure. Let's take instead of using all n points, if n is like your full population of billions of points. Maybe take a random subset and take an average of those. And the expected value, you expect that average to be approximately this. And the larger the subset you take, the closer it will be to this actual gradient. That's right. So, so you could take some subset. So if this is your full batch of endpoints, you could take a subsample n of size capital N, just re-indexed it m1 through m capital N, and then you can compute the average loss on just that subset of points. All right? With a very easy calculation, you could find that the expected value of this gradient is equal to the true full batch gradient. All right? It's an estimate. So the key point is that this estimate of the empirical risk gradient on capital N subsample of data points is equal to the actual full gradient. And of course, the bigger the mini batch, the better the estimate. So I want to try to give a little more intuition on why this might be just fine. So first of all, obviously, if your estimate is, is really good, there's almost no difference in the gradient direction. So if, you, if you, your capital N is, is large enough, the distance should be negligible in your gradient. But even if it's not entirely negligible, intuitively, gradient descent, it's an iterative algorithm, right? So we pick a direction, we go there, pick another direction, go there. Every time we step, we, we correct, right? Every time we get to a new point, we redirect ourselves 
back in the gradient direction. And so given that it's an iterative process anyway, it certainly seems that you know, minor deviations along the path can be and will be corrected later with more noisy gradient estimates. Anyway, that's, that's the intuition I have, that um, it's OK to be off a little bit because it's an iterative algorithm anyway. As long as the step directions are unbiased, so the expected value is, is correct, these things will average out, and you will get where you need to go. OK, so these are just words. One needs a theorem for this to make sense, and we'll come to one. OK, so the trade-offs of mini, so the subsample that you use is called a mini batch. And there's these trade-offs. So a bigger mini batch, obviously you have a better estimate of the gradient. On the other hand, it takes longer to compute. Smaller mini batch, not as good estimate of the gradient, but it's faster to compute. How small can we take this? We can take a mini batch size of one, and things still work. Stochastic gradient descent is with a mini batch size of one, one point estimates of your gradient. Are those good estimates of the gradient? No, they're terrible. They're terrible, but they're unbiased. So as you accumulate gradient steps, noisy as they are, they average out in some way to the right path. Okay. So does it mean that you're basically the sample changes from iteration to iteration that you're using? Yeah, so, well, I don't know what we mean by iteration exactly, but with every step, you have a fresh draw of capital N uh, data points. Yeah. OK, just some terminology because you'll see it around. So gradient descent is often called batch gradient descent in the sense that you're using the full batch of training data to choose your step direction. Mini batch gradient descent we've defined. Um, Yoshua Bengio is kind of a master of the field of neural networks where stochastic gradient descent is, is um, very prominent. And his advice, which we should take seriously, is um, Think of mini batches in the range of like one to a few hundred. These are this is a typical mini batch size. Uh, you know, think like tens make sense. Why? Uh, the issue, the thing is that because of the way processors work, you can vectorize certain computations, and you get a lot of. Uh, you could almost, for instance, calculate your um, empirical risk gradient on 10 examples as fast as on one example, just because of vectorization of your computation. And so you almost get batches up to a certain size for free compared to a batch of size one. Um, and so yeah, you'd want to use, if you have no um, computational penalty from everything we've said so far, it seems like you'd want to take your mini batch as large as you can with no computational penalty. Um, so one question you had earlier was, what about getting stuck in local minima? And this is absolutely an issue for non-convex functions. What people are starting to um, note is that this stochastic gradient descent, this mini batch gradient descent, may have advantages besides computational, and that it may actually help you get to the right local minima, the, the better local minima, by kind of constantly giving your path a little bit of random noise, which may help you get out of the local minima and find kind of the, the better minima. Uh, there, do people change with the bridge sizes with progress? So I would imagine if, uh, if you're running it for a long time, you would want to have more precise gradient. So the intuition, I agree with you completely. The question, the, should the batch size change as you progress in the sense that maybe once you're closer to the minimum, you'll then want a more precise gradient. You don't want to be bothering with all this, all this noise. Is that the, right. So um, I don't actually know of people doing that in practice. So I don't know if it's because it doesn't work as well as, as you and I are thinking or, um, it, it doesn't, I'm not sure exactly, but yeah. good question. Okay, so 
I promised some theory on SGD. Um, so in practice, uh, fixed, fixed step size for SGD can work well, but I don't have a theorem for you on that. But in practice, people do this, and they, they may, for instance, start with one step size, and then when it stops improving, they'll decrease the step size, and then monitor it for a while, and then decrease it again. It's kind of typical practice for SGD step size. Um, but we do have a theorem, uh, which involves a decreasing step size following a more of a formula. So if eta sub t is the step size at round t, we have these robbins monroe conditions or kind of classical conditions on um, basically characterizing how quickly eta sub t should decrease. It should decrease quickly, but not too quickly. That's what these square summable and summable conditions say. In practice, what does that mean? Eta t should be something like 1 over t. So as if t is step size, this if t is step number, eta t should decrease something like 1 over t. It could be slower, but it should be faster than 1 over square root of t. That's what the theorem offers you. Um, in a few weeks, we'll talk about support vector machines and a very fast method for that called Pegasus. Pegasus is nothing really but stochastic gradient descent with a 1 over t step size rule, for instance. Okay. Um, there's some reference I link here and on the page for lots of tricks of the trade for stochastic gradient descent. Um, 